Well, here's an alter alternative perspective. Uh, a view of God, God's sovereignty that incorporates flexibility. And this view of God is immutable uh, in his God-defining attributes, immutable in love and, uh, in, 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 uh, attributes like omnipotence and omniscience and things of that sort, uh, but flexible in, 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 in his experience and plans and interactions because he's interacting with a world that is forever changing. And precisely because God is, is invariant in his perfect character, he's perfectly variant in his experience and interactions and responses. Because that's what it is to be a perfect personal being. Plato, you can understand why he would say that perfection uh, never uh, changes because he's talking about abstract forms. But if you're talking about a, a personal being, what it means to be perfect is something very different. And I think one of the fundamental mistakes that the early church made was they took a, a definition of perfection that applied to abstract forms and would apply to mathematical formulas and things of that sort, and they applied it to a personal being. In this alternative perspective, then, the future is not eternally settled, but is at least partly open to possibilities. So here's the open view of the future in a nutshell. And I uh, like to call it the open view of the future as opposed to the open view of God, because while it presupposes that God is open to creation, that's not its main distinctive, because there's, in fact, most theologies would want to say that. I think this view does it more consistently than others, but that's not its main distinctive. Its main distinctive, I will argue, is its view of reality, and more specifically, its view of the future. In this view, God knows all things. God knows all things. I, I want to emphasize that point because you read any book that critiques this view, and they will say that the open view doesn't think that God knows all things. I, I haven't met an open theist who denies that God knows all things. God is omniscient. Reality and God's knowledge are, are coextensive. Now, there are some that would qualify that a little bit and say God knows all that can be known because there are truths out there that are, are by definition unknowable, and we could argue about that, and I think that view is wrong, but, that, that's, but they don't deny omniscience, that whatever is real, God knows if it's knowable. God knows all things. But the all things, and here's the distinctive view, the all things that God knows includes future possibilities. So the view is some of reality like the past, the present, and some of the future, is definite. It's definitely this way, and definitely not that way. It's definite, and therefore it's perfectly known by God as such, because God knows all things. He knows them exactly as they are. So whatever is definite, God knows as definite. But some of reality in this view, namely some of the future, is indefinite. It's possibly this way, and possibly that way, and precisely because God is omniscient and knows all of reality exactly as it is and not otherwise, God knows it as possibly this way and possibly that way. So in the open view, what's distinctive is that we hold that possibilities are ontologically real. They're not just due to the fact that human beings have limited knowledge. Rather, they're built into reality. Possibilities are ontologically real. And God knows all of reality perfectly and therefore knows the definite as definite and the possible as possible. In this view, God settles whatever he chooses ahead of time, and he opens up possibilities ahead of time to whatever extent he chooses. I, um, it's a gross simplification, but the best analogy I have of the open view of uh, the future is, uh, and I don't know even know if they still make these, but when I was a kid they did. It's the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Are those still around? Oh, the, okay, I, I can still keep on using this uh, analogy and it'll have meaning to people who are younger than 50. Um, <laughs> but you know, choose your own adventure book. The, the novelist writes stories. It's a story, but the reader gets to choose uh, uh, between possible storylines. If you think Sally should buy the dog, go to page number this. If you think Sally should not buy the dog, go to that page. And then, so now you, you're on the story where Sally buys the dog. Well, if you think the dog should get, you know, should go across the street and, and get hit by a car, then go to this page. If you think it shouldn't go across the street, uh, then go to this page. And, and, and the, the, the book branches out into several possibilities and then ends up with several different endings. That is something like, infinitely simplified, of course, but something like the open view of, of providence, the open view of reality. God sets the parameters of reality. Uh, he sets the parameters within which spontaneity and creativity and free decisions can make, human, angelic, and, 
And, the, and down to quantum particles, there's a determinate structure to reality, but within the determinate structure of reality, uh, there are possibilities that can get played out. There's, there's a number of ways this thing can go. Now, there are limits to that, so it's not a wide open free-for-all, but there is genuine openness within the parameters uh, that God sets. He delimits reality to whatever extent he wants, but he leaves it open to whatever extent that he wants. This is why I really think that openness theologians make a mistake when they say that God doesn't know the future. Uh, because if you were to ask the novelist of a great Choose Your Own Adventure uh, book, do you know the future of your book? The novelist should say, well, of course I do. I wrote the thing. Now, do you know which, which future the, uh, the reader is going to choose? Well, no. But you asked me a question about the book. And, uh, and so I would want to say, yes, God knows the future perfectly. And the future partly consists of possibilities. And that's why he knows the future partly as a realm of possibilities. Some would disagree with that, but I give them the right to be wrong if they want. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. This is a very important point. And then I'm going to get into some of the reasons why people hold to the open view. But I would argue, and I think most openness folks would argue, that God is infinitely intelligent. There's no, there's no upper limit to his intelligence. And therefore, he can anticipate each possibility as perfectly as if it was a certainty. And I think this is a very important point. The reason is that I, I used to be puzzled. Up until maybe five or six years ago, I, I was always puzzled how very smart people seemed to have trouble understanding this perspective. Um, and I, I, you know, people that I know are, are very smart and, and can figure stuff out, they would keep on uh, charging the same, uh, the openness view of, of, of making the same mistakes. Even if we answered it very coherently, they keep on repeating it over and over again. And they keep mis 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 misrepresenting that. And at first I thought, are they intentionally trying to caricature the view? And maybe there's some of that going on. But the Bible says to believe all things and hope all things, so I try to give the best interpretation to everything, so I want to believe that they're sincerely representing it as they understand it, and yet they're representing it so poorly, and yet I know they're smart, how is that possible? And a coin fell in the slot for me some time ago where I, I realized that for a lot of people, the open view, the idea that the future is not exhaustively settled, either in God's will or in God's mind, it creates fear in them. They, they, they're afraid. It feels to them like God is out of control. The world's out of control. How do you know he's going to win in the end? Uh, how do you know that he can bring good out of evil? You know, what if he gets caught off guard and, and, and this, the, the, the whole cosmos takes a left turn and Satan does something radical he didn't anticipate and you know, the whole world literally goes to hell in a handbasket. And there's this kind of terror that descends on some people. Uh, the idea of God at least foreknowing, if not preordaining the whole of the future, is for many people a real source of security. And I also know that it's impossible to really learn something that you're terrified of. Uh, you, when, once your amygdala kicks in, your fight or flight reaction is in place, and your neocortex is doing very little activity. <laughs> and, uh, and this is why I now, whenever I go to speak to an audience that is potentially hostile, and back in those days, in the 90s, almost every audience was hostile, uh, but I, I, I first have to, put, have to put them at ease, and I do it with this uh, infinite intelligence argument. And here's the, here's the argument in a nutshell. The reason why you and I have trouble anticipating possibilities uh, as effectively as certainties, in fact, we can't anticipate possibilities as effectively as we do certainties, the reason we ha that's the case is because we're finite in intelligence. We have a limited amount of intelligence to go around. Some of us more limited than others, for sure, but all of us limited. And uh, so if I have three possibilities I have to consider, I have to, I have to fraction up my attention and intelligence in thirds to cover those three possibilities. If I have 30, I have to spread it even thinner. Whereas if I only have one thing to pay attention to, well, I can be preparing myself for, for that all day long. So we're less effective at anticipating possibilities than we are certainties. This is why if you're playing chess, it's a lot more stressful if, you, if it matters to you than if you're working on an assembly line. Because in a, in a chess game, you've got to anticipate all the possibilities. They might move there, and I then have to move here, and then I might move there. And, and there's all these possibilities you have to consider. Whereas if you're working on an assembly line, you know that the bolt goes in that hole all day long. And, and so you don't stress out over that. <laughs> 